To give ground um, on this would be giving ground on um, the basis of our national heritage, and that's not something that I'm prepared to do. Our national heritage, which is 225 years old compared to the 40,000 year old First Nations culture. Where do your beliefs come from? My dad was always a big liberal, so I grew up always supporting the Liberal Party. When I was a bit older, um, I sort of, you know, came across these anti-SJW videos on YouTube. Now, after that, I sort of was a little bit interested and intrigued by um, politics, and I decided to research it a bit further. So I came across commentators such as Ben Shapiro, um, amongst others, you know, Jordan Peterson as well. And then I sort of started to develop a more intellectual framework uh, for my beliefs. Well, my basic beliefs like come from my family. I think like dad was always adamant like healthcare should be available to everyone. Like it doesn't make sense that people die because they couldn't get healthcare. Um, but he was actually never really political. Um, so as I got older and got more into it, I did my own research and was always interested in the environment. I did scouts growing up. As I've read more and like under worked in different industries and different kinds of employment, my experience of the world's changed and my political views are where they are today. Do you think your beliefs would change if you'd been born into a different family? You know, all of us are products of our um, environment in terms of our beliefs, the way we're brought up and stuff like that. Um, if I was born overseas in a different country, I'd be you know, inculcated with a totally different culture. Um, if I was born in a left-wing family, odds on I'd be you know, a left-winger myself. Nothing to disagree with there. It's beliefs and what you support, what you do, what you do for a job, um, friendships, relationships, are all shaped by your environment. Yeah, I wouldn't say for sure if I would have the same beliefs if I lived 100 years ago, for example. The date of Australia Day should change. It's 26th of January. Uh, James Cook, who's the main icon of the day, didn't land in Australia that day. Australia wasn't discovered that day. The first fleet don't think even arrived. We didn't officially become a sovereign nation until the 1st of January 1901. It's just a date that's also been picked out of the hat. If we do want to celebrate a national day to celebrate our sovereignty, there are better days to choose, I think. It is the beginning of um, repression and uh, attempted uh, genocide of First Nations peoples because those consequences are still being felt. If when we celebrate the beginning of it, so explicitly on January 26th, it, I think it's understandable that people can feel trauma um, with that celebration. All right, well, look, obviously I disagree, but it's no secret that um, you know, quite a few people on the, the hard left um, dislike um, the British uh, heritage of our nation and the accomplishments which have uh, you know, uh, arisen from that framework. Um, a vast majority of Australians are happy um, with uh, the date of Australia Day being on January 26th. We, we see uh, activists attempting to strike right at the heart of our national consciousness by um, attacking Australia Day, um, in my view, um, and, and they use you know, very heated rhetoric such as Invasion Day um, to, to really um, try and threaten uh, our sort of security and our, uh, our national heritage. Um, now, we're not a perfect country by any means, but we're pretty good. I think we should be proud of that and uh, stop taking the black armband uh, view of history um, at all times. Why couldn't we just move the date to celebrate our British heritage? Like, the 1st of January is when we first become a nation. We have been celebrating um, Australia Day uh, since 1935. It only became a public holiday 24 um, years ago. But even before 1935, we were celebrating something called Anniversary Day um, in New South Wales. Um, this is, you know, we've been doing this for over 100 years. It is a strong sort of uh, part of our tradition. Um, and it's become so symbolic at this point um, that to give ground um, on this would be giving ground on um, the basis of our national heritage, and that's not something that I'm prepared to do. Our national heritage, which is 225 years old compared to the 40,000 year old First Nations culture. Yes, but, but I think um, we've, we've accomplished a lot as a country and we should be proud of what we've done as a country. And the fact that we are a shining light um, of the world in many respects in terms of democracy, in terms of freedom, and we should remind ourselves and be positive instead of being negative. Um, certainly on Aboriginal issues, I know there's issues with um, Aboriginal deaths in custody, um, as well as inequality, and we can work on that. Um, but let's not go about that by trying to, um, you know, destroy our national consciousness and pride because we'll be demoralised, we'll be weak, and it'll make people feel bad about themselves. National culture doesn't exist. It's something that's made up. Ours is so new and 
it's so multicultural and diverse. It's so I don't understand the need to celebrate a culture so young. I think we should celebrate that we are so young, but to enforce it over um, the traditional owners of land, I think, is in a way or is disrespectful. So a follow-up question. Do you think Australia should become a republic, assuming that there would be an effective transition of powers? I don't think republic is the better option, I think, at the moment. Cool. Uh, personally, um, I do believe uh, in monarchy over republic. Um, the issue with the republic is if we elect our president, we're going to centralise all this power uh, regarding you know, the formation of government in a political representative, which will mean that uh, people will have less trust naturally um, in the decisions of that person because they will see uh, the political um, influence. What do you think of the Governor-General sacking Whitlam without consulting the Queen? I actually don't know much about this one, mate. It will be before my time, I will say. The right to freedom of assembly or protest should be able to be revoked in times of national emergency, such as during a pandemic or for public safety. It just depends on where you draw the line. So for instance, this coronavirus pandemic, during the height of it, yeah, I think it was fair to impose restrictions and limits on public gatherings. Everyone has to do their part and having a 4,000 strong protest, even if it's socially distant and precautions are taken, well, you can't catch everything. But what we saw from governments, especially the New South Wales government, to restrict those uh, gatherings for against uni cut, uni fee hikes um, and uni funding, I think that was irresponsible, especially considering by that point there'd been gatherings for months. People were going to shopping centres, football matches, and I think it was a political decision to restrict it. I don't think it's a simple cut as yes or no. Climate change action should be led by the free market as opposed to through government interjection. Affordable and reliable energy um, is a really important part of our day-to-day uh, -day quality of life. During the day, when demand is low, uh, renewable energy excels. So the sun is shining, solar energy is producing at close to maximum output. Um, there's typically more wind during the day as well. And it's flooding the energy grid with a lot of electricity, um, causing prices to, um, to go down because demand is low and there's a lot of electricity. Now, when it hits night time, your coal energy is going to, be, is going to become a much bigger part um, of the electricity makeup, uh, as well as gas to firm the, the grid during peak demand. But the coal has already absorbed massive loss during the day, and it's actually not profitable anymore for coal companies um, to operate plants, which is why they're shutting down and no new ones want to be built. By increasing this capacity, we're setting ourselves up for failure going forward. I do believe government regulation is uh, necessary to protect the environment, um, because corporations are made up of individuals who afford and will act out of self-interest, and that might mean selling out the long term for the short term. So we need to talk about practical solutions, um, balancing the uh, climate change consideration with the quality of life and energy policy consideration. And we need to come together and, and figure out a workable way forward, which uh, addresses both of these points. I don't believe the free market can fix struggles we're facing because it's also the cause of them. Your Pacific Island's already facing climate dangers. We've got uh, coups carried out in Bolivia for their lithium. Um, so. The free market has shown that if we do try and fix it through their apparatus, the impoverished world will suffer the consequences of those decisions. I think you mentioned about coal having to operate for the night. Um, there's batteries, special my, um, minerals have to be mined and in itself causes environmental damage. And then we have to talk about the other options. Yeah. I, in short, I don't see it, the free market being the solution because it is the problem. I have close friends whose political beliefs differ greatly from mine. Um, yeah, I've just got friends who are members of the Labour Party, different socialist parties. I've got good friends at work who do lean a bit more towards liberals. Um, and like in my own family, I've had One Nation supporters. It's a mixed bag. It's like it's the world. I don't really see the point of kicking up a fuss. If yeah, certainly a lot of people in my family are quite left-wing as well. So that can be, uh, and make for some, you know, sometimes awkward or tense conversations, uh, especially around, you know, the dinner table. Um, but in terms of friends, you have a couple of friends who are, um, you know, align more to labor. But obviously, you know, it's easy to gravitate towards people who um, share the same values and beliefs as you. But um, I try to, to make an effort to, you know, be friends with everyone. Rupert Murdoch's current volume of ownership of Australia's news media is dangerous. Yeah, I think it, in short, it's become too monopolised. 
I don't think any one person should have that much influence over our media, which controls a lot of the knowledge and information in our society and our culture. It should be broken up in a way that doesn't, I said, doesn't serve the interest of people like Murdoch. So if Murdoch dies, I think there's some people who think that's it. We're going to have a fair democracy again. It's like, no, because we're going to have different people similar to Murdoch own his papers. First of all, I'd like to say that having media diversity and a lot of range of points of view available was important in any functional democracy. Murdoch's papers, um, editorially, obviously, lean quite conservative, but he does make an attempt um, in his papers, especially the Australian, to include more centrist points of view. So you have your Peter Van Ronsloons, your Nicky Savers. Now, they're not exactly left wing at the same time, but it's not just a right wing echo chamber either. But as well, you have um, plenty of other left-wing outlets um, available. For instance, The Guardian, which is unabashedly left-wing. They don't make any effort. They're not left-wing. Well, I would consider them left-wing as a right-winger. And I don't think they make much effort to include um, conservative perspectives in their um, editorials or in their coverage. The Sydney Morning Herald is more centrist. They reach a large percentage of the population too. The ABC and SBS, I mean, the ABC, it's a a trope, right? It's it's left-wing. You might disagree. Um, I think the ABC has become less left-wing in, in recent times and more um, you know, centrist and fair and balanced, which is good. Um, I think that we're, we're getting you know, both sides of the story pretty well at this point in time. So I think my problem with the Murdoch empire is it does influence what is reported on other papers. One of the best examples I've seen is um, Fox News recorded, uh, reported on Obama like barely saluting a soldier coming off Air Force One. That made it the CNN, MSNBC, all the other American left-wing outlets. Um, and it's the same in Australia if the Murdoch papers are reporting on the stories. And they're probably going to get picked up by other outlets. I think the claiming Guardian are left-wing, I think, is disingenuous because the amount of opinion pieces slandering like centre-left people like Corbyn and Sanders, they supported Lib Dems in the UK. They're not that left-wing. Um, and then the ABC, if the ABC were left wing, where are all the trots, where are the anarchists, where are the uh, communists on their programs? There aren't any. They picture... The They're green. not hard left. They're not hard left by any means, but they're gone. Um, why aren't those people platformed in any of our media? We've got people like Craig Murphy, um, Mark Latham, Alan Jones, who are, I wouldn't say like alt far right, but they're definitely really solid right wing people that um, get platformed over good solid left-wing points of view we certainly don't have a lot of um hard left media um like i know um what is it red flag exists as a social alternative publication but you know no one's stopping them from um publicizing their stuff online i know they have a print copy pretty regularly as well um it's just a matter of who buys it um, i know they have you know a large dedicated follower base but you know social terms doesn't represent a huge point of the population in extension to the media question, do you think media nowadays has become too polarised and people get stuck into their own ecosystem rather than listening to the other perspectives? I think in Australia it's not so bad. I think the United States is the model of how we definitely don't want to go. We have a very polarised um, situation in the United States. It leads to division, it leads to chaos, unrest, violence, etc. We don't want that happening in Australia, in my view. I think um, we, uh, we probably have things close to being right now, but we've got to be careful. In the sh- oh, yeah, it's definitely much worse in America because of the pardon sh- partisanship between the supporters of both parties. Um, when in Australia, I think we've got more third parties. So we've got like One Nation, Shrews and Fishers, Cato, the Greens, um, Nick Xenophon and so on. It's not, it's not as strong. Um, and then even then, there's also factions within parties. I think that partisanship ref- is reflected in the media. And then probably the media like feed off it. So it's like discursive between the two. Lowering corporate tax rates is an effective means of stimulating the economy and creating jobs. So yeah, look, I would somewhat agree with this one, um, but it's a question again of um, degrees and specifics. First one is we want a fairly business friendly climate um, in this country. But the other thing would be is, well, we want our companies and corporations to give back to the country which they're operating in. And we want them to act ethically and socially, uh, responsibly, um, and paying taxes is part of that. The other side of that though was, you know, these companies took that money sometimes and just did share buybacks. So it's not, you know, it doesn't totally flow flow, flow through, apologies, um, you know, to, to benefit everyone, but a lot of it does still. Well, they probably stimulate the economy, but the economy doesn't benefit workers um, because there obviously is less to spend in infrastructure, education, hospitals, and all of those. Um, and I think since corporate tax started to be cut, we've seen the casualization of the workforce. Didn't 
work under Hawke, it didn't work under Thatcher, it didn't work under Reagan. So in extension to that, in times of uh, economic crisis, recession, depression, should government use the same approach it is today in terms of handouts to people with high marginal propensities to consume? Or should they apply those corporate tax rates instead? I think, yeah, stimulus, I think, has proven the work. It, it, back in the 2008 GFC, Rudd handed out about $900 to everyone. Um, and people spend it. Like, if you're not so well off, you're probably going to spend that towards your rent, your food, your bills, which still puts money in the economy. And then obviously with the latest pandemic uh, financial crash, we've seen people able to put heads over their house, put food on the table thanks to job seeker, job keeper. People have been healthier because of that. Or if they're on incomes or receiving benefits that are below the poverty line, they eat less, they're less healthy, which obviously long term doesn't do them as well because they have to go to hospital and um, more bills. They're not able to contribute to society as much. Yeah, I definitely agree that stimulus is important, especially during this coronavirus pandemic, job keeper, job seeker, um, job maker as well, all these you know, job whatever programs, these have all been pretty helpful in, in tying us through. Um, obviously there is a, a budgetary concern. This has totally blown out um, our debt and it's gonna be years and years and years before we pay this one down, which is unfortunate. And the flip side of that is lowering taxes won't do anything to help that, which is, uh, which is the other thing. Um, at the same time, businesses have suffered too. It's not just consumers in, a, in an economy, there's also businesses and how they operate. Um, I think businesses, obviously, they've um, been assisted with things like JobKeeper, um, but we need to ensure that businesses are well supported coming out of um, the coronavirus pandemic to ensure that the people and the organisations which create um, all of our jobs in this nation um, can actually continue to operate and, and provide jobs to people. Organisations should have diversity quotas. So I think this is, I think, framed too black and white, but I think there are social benefits to it. So having more women in positions of power and being platformed does give people opportunities to talk about issues that haven't been talked about before. So domestic violence, uh, the pe gender pay gap, uh, obviously there's similar things with if we platform more First Nations people. I think the goal of it should be to, in the end, get rid of the quotas. So you've built a organization that is multicultural, uh, gender inclusive. Yes, yeah, so I'm generally very averse to, to the idea of quotas. My principle is that we should be striving for a um, meritocratic and, and fair society as much as possible. Women are you know, very much encouraged to um, enter public service, the workplace. There are existing quotas um, for women and other minority groups. So if we actually look at the evidence of uh, systemic discrimination towards any group, well, it's very clear that the people benefiting right now um, are clearly um, women and minority groups. Now, obviously, this is not contributing to the idea in the long term of a meritocratic and fair society. Um, the way I think we achieve that is by eliminating these quotas, but we need to ensure um, at the same time, because not everyone is going to start at the same stage in life. People will be you know, born to a well-connected family or a wealthy family, other people will not. We need to provide a baseline level um, of uh, you know, educational attainment for everyone in Australia so that people can have a chance uh, to actually succeed on their own merits and not be held back um, by factors that they you know, don't control. My view in general is that these quotas um, are unmeritocratic, um, unfair. Um, yeah, I don't think unfair is necessarily the right word because the system we already have is even more unfair. So getting more women into engineering, into uh, corporate sectors. So would it be fair uh, to say that you both agree on quality of opportunity versus uh, quality of outcome? It's very hard to get there. It's a total quality of opportunity because life is life. Life is not fair. You know, some people, just the way they're born, some people are born really smart. Um, and some people born really tall and good at basketball kind of thing. So, so look, the, the idea of equality of, of opportunity as much as possible is good in my view. Um, and I think we should be aiming to strive towards that. Yeah, I agree. I think it's more about equal opportunity, but yeah, you know, quotas are definitely a way to get there, but not the be and end all. Maybe we, we agree somewhat on that one. How about mm. that? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you could be friends with the other person? Um, yeah, he seems alright. Yeah, I reckon we could be friends, but um, he's got to want to be friends with me too, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, if we work together, we'll probably have to get to know each other a bit more and find out our hobbies and we'll probably find a bit more middle ground there and then our politics. So do you think it is important to talk to people who disagree with you? 100%. That's the whole point of democracy, right? You have to get to 51%. You have to convince people who are not 
for you in your camp who are you know either way and even people who are on the other side because in the end we're in it together and we've got to make it work uh, he, do you like talking to people you know, like when I've been at polling booths and like phone banking and that sort of thing when I'm like hey I'm with the Greens and they're like oh okay but at the end they're like oh actually you make a really good point and so I do enjoy talking to people who are not so familiar with what the Greens actually stand for and um, what we believe in it's been very interesting talking to you today you know definitely uh, your your opinions on left-wing politics um, are different to what I expected yeah, that's uh, good Jeez, man. yeah so I think the way people view conservatives is very hardline that like you're never going to agree with them there always is a middle ground on some regard like we both agree that your environment shapes your political views deaths in custody is an issue yeah we probably did disagree on more than we did agree on I yeah. would say but a little bit to be expected. I'm not surprised. Yeah. No, but it was fun. I enjoyed this. So thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you.